Mailbox. I am your host tonight, Mickey Angeline, and I have a very special guest with me tonight. The topic of discussion will be mobilizing progressives for this election and beyond. So I welcome to the show Ron Cooper, retired director, executive director for Access Sacramento. I want to thank you for being here today. Ah, Mickey, thank you for inviting me. This is going to be a really good show because our topics are going to be totally raw, candid, everything to do with the election per se, but before we get into that, we would like to give a shout out to our sponsors. Pieces Pizza on 21st Street between Capital and N. They have been a longtime supporter of Soapbox. They constantly feed our crew every evening. We love it, can't get enough of it. Go and visit them at 21st between Capital and N Streets in downtown Sacramento. That's Pieces Pizza, Pizza by the Slice. Also, The Humor Times by James Israel. It's a comic satire chocked full of cartoons every, with a monthly subscription, giving you the funnier side of politics. To subscribe, you can go to humortimes.com or give them a call at 916-455-1217. And be sure to like us on Facebook and give us a follow. You want to learn about other shows and especially Soapbox, just find us on Facebook at Soapbox Sacramento. Give us a like and comment. And finally, we now have a YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. That is at Soapbox Sacramento on YouTube. So here we are back on the show. Thank you again, Ron, for being here. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, for people that might recognize me from uh when I was here at executive director, it was a little bit different. I, as executive director, I was always neutral. Yeah, I bet. It's been, <laughs> so. Yeah, it's been a while, and you've had to, you've had to play that uh, right. neutral field. But tonight, not going to happen. That's right. Not going to happen right. at all. So um, we are going to discuss, particularly, particularly the election, and the candidates mm -hmm. who we have now, that have been. For those of you who live under a rock, don't know, we are now battling between Hillary Clinton and of all people, Donald Trump, right, right, for the next president of the United States. And, and we also had Jill Stein and we did. Gary Johnson with the uh, Green and Libertarian parties. Yes. Yep. And let's not forget Bernie. And Bernie. <laughs> yes. Bernie, Ber Bernie, Bernie. I have to say, I actually, um, I really was kind of pulling for Bernie. Yes. A lot of it because of how, how in touch he was with the everyday person. I mean, he came out to Sacramento, and I know the, the artists who were able to perform with him mm -hmm. and had nothing but great things to say about him. I yeah. loved that he was so in tune with the people's needs and what the people wanted. We didn't really get that with the other candidates. No, and I, you know, it all started with when he was mayor, and I forget the uh, town in Vermont where he was from originally, but he was mayor. That's how he started his political career, and he was the only mayor in the United States at the time that had his own public access TV show. So he had a show just like this, and that got him started. So there you I go. I just learned Mickey, something. Yeah. Well, you know, I have to be honest with everybody. I am not that, I, I do not know as much as I should, and I'm so glad Ron is here because I think through you I'm going to learn a heck, whole heck of a lot more. You also wanted to reference an author. Right. Kind of talking about um, um, what we're going to discuss tonight. Um, George Lakoff. George Lakoff. Right? And it's a particular book called Don't Think of an elephant. Right. right. And what do you think of? Once you say that, <laughs> an elephant. Right. Right? So now this book, um, a little bit about it, Don't Think of an Elephant is the definitive handbook for understanding what happened in the 2004 U.S. election and communicating effectively about key issues facing America today. Author George Lakoff has become a key advisor to the Democratic Party, helping them develop their message and frame political debate. So what is it in particular that you like so much about this book and that you wanted to um, kind of bring to light in today's well, show? It, as a uh, uh, Democrat for many years, and I consider myself kind of a closet progressive, um, the, the key thing that I learned from this particular book was the kind of long-term strategic thinking that went into um, the Republican Party uh, back during the Reagan era, realizing that they really were not going to win based on uh, popular vote. They had to really get out the vote. Um, they had to somehow mend together uh, various perspectives of, of the political right. 
uh, mixing together, you know, pro-gun pro and um, anti-abortion and uh, fiscal conservatism and so forth into a political movement. And so um, they used, which Lakoff's um, specialty is, is um, semantics and uh, the use of language. He's a professor at uh, Cal Berkeley. And uh, it was his analysis in Don't Think of an Elephant of the importance of uh, words and speaking on point from a variety of perspectives. And if you think about it over the last 40 or 50 years, uh, I think the Republicans have always had, the conservative right has always had a focus to the variety of different perspectives of getting their candidate elected, of staying on point, on message, of coming up with names for nuclear missiles called the peacekeeper, um, owning the flag and patriotism. The, this wasn't random. This was a strategic thinking on how to unify and rally. Um, and then over time, as the, as the uh, I'm kind of squishing a lot down, but yeah. over time, as the religious right became more and more involved, um, the focus became more on wedge issues of looking at the Democrats and particularly progressive voices within the Democratic Party that tended to be in the Democratic Party because of their particular issue. I'm a, I'm a Mexican-American voter and I have my issues. I am a gay rights advocate and I have my issues. I, uh, want the freedom to choose for women, I have my right, issues. Exactly. And, and what's tended to happen, and Lakoff makes this point, is that those approximately 18 distinct constituencies within the left are constantly at odds with each other. They agree in a lot of principles, but they argue their particular point as the most important point, where the Republicans have the same kind of uh, challenges, but they have come to find common areas of agreement and vote for their given candidate in a unified way. And that's been the tradition up until this election. This election kind of changes that. This election, I don't even know. It has been so, oh, just one word dramatic. Yes. I mean, especially because I didn't think we discussed this earlier, how this election is different even than in the last four to eight years where this is the first time I can remember having to hide and block so many people on my Facebook alone. Yes. Because they're just sharing all of the dirt, the, the mudslinging between right. the two candidates, right? Right. Um, and they're sharing memes that are created by people that don't know what they're talking about. Right. And it's not even that it's fact-based or it's about issues like political stance. It's just attitude. You had mentioned part of this book uh, discusses and touches on how people vote based more on their emotion. Right. Than facts. And, and uh, that's a hard one, I think, for uh, liberals and progressives in particular, because we like to argue our case and make our points based on, uh, well, I, not all the time, but, but I think we like to think that intellectual discourse, um, full-throated engagement of the freedoms that our Constitution affords us, of debate, of, a, of a kind of a liberal philosophy to life and, and political discussion, that that will somehow win the day in a democracy. So we really feel that way. Uh, but that's not necessarily how people, when they get in the privacy of the voting booth, uh, and we're seeing that in a full-throated way with Trump, because Donald Trump, I, I've heard this said about him, and I agree, <coughs> he is who he is. He has been the same outrageous character throughout his entire life. This is true. He has not changed. In not, and, and one of the things that fascinates me is when he was 29 years old and wanted to get into real estate, his dad was big in Queens, real estate in Queens. And his dad said, I want you to take over. And he said, no, Dad, I'm going to go for Manhattan. His whole life had been looking across to the skyline of Manhattan. So he wanted to get in Manhattan, but he didn't know anybody. So his first mentor was Roy Cohn. Now, Roy Cohn uh, was the attorney during the McCarthy years, and he was the rabid kind of meat-eating dog that was just attacking 
everybody and pushing Senator McCarthy to be more and more rabid in his uh, and so Roy, because that was Roy Cohn's philosophy, attack, 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 never apologize. The more that you that got... That sounds a lot like Trump. Exactly. And the more, exactly that you like get <laughs> the more that you get negative press, you dominate the press. Right. By saying negative things. Well, he was, that's how he got into Manhattan real estate. That's how he made his initial money was through Roy Cohn's connections on Manhattan and this style that he calls it negotiation. But it really is bullying. Oh, yeah. But it's, eff it's effective. He is such a bully. Yes. And, and so he does it well. Uh, if you take him on, uh, he will better you because he's better at that. But it does not lend itself to any kind of policy statement because he needs to read the crowd. The, the Apprentice was a good show for him because he could play off of people and one against the other. That's what he likes to do. But as far as saying, you know, I'm going to say something today, going back to Bernie Sanders. Right. I'm going to say something today, and I'll be saying that five years from now, and I'll be saying that ten years from now, and I'll, I'll look at it, and I'll evaluate it, and I'll improve it, and I'll make it better. That's not how Trump thinks. He never has. It's, it's a, he's a person of the moment, a person that will bully you and just outlast you with any kind of misstatement, fact, uh, misstated fact, any kind of outright lie, just fabricating things. Because at the bottom of this, and this is what I hope progressives understand, it's all about rage. It's all about tapping into anger. It's all about, uh, it was really funny, I was uh, in the car to Dan, I was listening to NPR, right. actually, right? And they had a TED talk about fear. And the guy, the scientist, was commenting about how we are wired in our evolution, in our genes. He said, just think back. There you are walking through the high grass in the African veldt somewhere, our, our ancestors, and you hear a noise off to your right in the bushes. Now, either that's just the wind or it's a lion and you're dead. Now, you could choose to think it's just the wind. But if you choose wrong, you're dead. You're dead. So you should always think it's a tiger. And then if it's the wind, you're no fine. problem. You're fine. Interesting. So we're wired to really always be on cue no, that's true. for fear. Yeah. And so if you are preaching fear, and in this case, fear of the other, which Donald Trump has kind of lucked into in his sense of a strategy, it taps into this primal fear. I'm, I'm afraid on some basic level. I don't understand it. It's so primitive. I don't understand it. He's telling me what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of Muslims. I'm afraid of Democrats. I'm afraid of Hillary Clinton. I'm afraid of them taking my guns away. And so it's like whatever your fear he's is. He's just feeling the fire. Yeah. And he knows how to do that. He's he been doing does that for it, He's years. done it his whole life. It's a businessman way a, of thinking. Yeah. A sales way of thinking. Yeah. He's and, got that down. Yes. And, but the and question is, 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 do you think he's qualified to I think run the country? Clinton's campaign is, is seizing on something that I think the, during the primaries they didn't really seize on, and that is to use his fiery bluster uh, as, a, as a criticism of his temperament. Because it's one thing to win an election, which is like a dogfight. He had 17 pit bulls. Well, some of them puppies, but <laughs> pit bulls, lined up and ready to fight. Well, in that environment, he was the best dog. He was the best pit bull at inciting and fueling and going after the throat, and you could put money on him, and that dog would win. But in, a, in an election, uh, he's going to, like I say, find a lot of voters who share that sense of fear and, share, and the sense of, of kind of trying to find an answer in, in, in out of this... Uh, this almost primal reaction. Um, but in, now he has to be, he's going to, he's really, I think, not looking forward to the debates. He's going to be challenged on policy. He's going to be challenged on who is advising you. Yeah. Because it's a complicated, th it's a complicated thing to run a country of 320 million people within the context of 7 billion people worldwide. And the fact that he doesn't know the basics even the basics. And he doesn't even listen to the people who advise him. 
It, right. He's so much so that no one that. no one wants to advise exactly. him. Exactly. I mean, they don't want to touch him with a 10-foot pole. That's right, because he doesn't listen <laughs> to them. And now it's, he's, it's like you don't want to be around him for fear that the smell rubs off on you. Um, but that said, uh, I, going back to our theme for today, that one of the key things, I think, for Democrats, for progressives, and just for thoughtful people of any stripe, Republican, Libertarian, uh, Green Party, whatever, we need to have leadership at all levels of government, local, state, and federal, that are thoughtful people and reasonable people. And there can be debate and discussion. That's what democracy encourages. Right. Um, and that what's going on with Trump is he's really lit a fire under this fear. And so whether it's Donald Trump or, as I suspect, 101 Trump-like candidates that will follow, because they've sensed now, wow, if I throw red meat out there, some are going to criticize me for, oh, you know, he's baiting the crowd and he's appealing to the lowest level. But then you see the number of people that thrive on that. Oh, it's, and it's, it's, it's frightening, but at the same time scary. exhilarating if you're an authoritarian type leader. If, if winning the day is everything, uh, then there is... There's an opportunity here to be seized. And so I, I don't think Donald Trump will be elected president, but I would expect to see Trump-like candidates to surface. So and we need to be thinking about that. Do you think Hillary's right for the job? I think she's extremely qualified. I think um, I find it interesting when you and I were talking in preparation for tonight. Um, it's, uh, in 2008, I voted for Hillary versus Obama. Right. Uh, when they were in the primaries. And because I do feel she's very qualified. I think that she started uh, one down because she believed Bill and she stood by Bill. And I think for she a lot of people. She did the wife thing. Yeah, she did. And, and for a lot of, I think, educated women, and I don't happen to be an educated woman, so I can't really speak totally knowledgeably about this issue, but I do think that it's hard to look at Hillary and say, why didn't you just dump him? Oh, yeah. Why, you know, that why, was the, why, I mean, why did you stand by him? I mean, him? I have friends, even today, I mean, women that have, some yeah. are all Hillary and some are so against her. There are some that don't even believe she's pro-women. Right. You know? And, that, and, that, and then I think feeds this mantra that's been fed by the, the right for a long time now in terms of the Clintons in general, now Hillary specifically, and that is she is not to be trusted. Right. And, the, and there is, I guess, a style, the way she speaks and so forth. Uh, but time and time and time again, they've looked at the statements that she's made. She's the most uh, honest in terms of truthfulness of any candidate. She's right there with Bernie when they actually do uh, analysis of she's uh, skilled in a variety of different areas in which each of those, you could, you could say, well, I nitpick that, and I don't think that, and I don't think this. But the cumulative is, who has that kind of range of experience in a variety of international and local, right. and, and, and from the heart, from a young woman of uh, striving to help children on health care issues and so forth. So well, you can especially get into, being the wife of a former president, she's already been there. Right. She's already been inside. She already right. knows how it rolls. But some questions surface, like how she changes her opinion on certain topics, right. issues, matters over the years. See, and I don't have a problem with that. As long as she's clear, I, I think this is... Because um, people can change, right? Well, I, or apparently is it more of a not. Political, or is it more of a political, well, I'm going to say this because this will get you me the votes. That's well, really the question, I guess isn't for, it? I guess for those who feel you really have to stay by your position come hell or high water, Donald Trump's a perfect candidate because right, yeah. Donald Trump never acknowledges any error. Every decision that he's ever made, <laughs> true. everything that he's ever said. His stuff does not stink. No. Ever. Ever. And, and I think that's what appeals to whoever it is that's <clears throat> voting for him yes. or whatever votes he's buying. Yeah, because the, what's the comment? I, and many of my relatives <clears throat> are pro-Trump and they all oh. comment. Yes. Wow. And, and they all comment about... <clears throat> that he is uh, consistent. Because that must be hard for you. That's why I said the wow, yeah, since it's, you're not. <laughs> it's, it's hard because invariably they are um, blue collar, hardworking, 
honest, you know, the all American kind of workers, and um, and I, I, I just I've tried every approach possible in the sense of you're voting against your own self interest because you're listening to the words as though uh, he's going to stick by these positions. He's going to somehow fight for the working man, although his track record. Uh, is to deprive jobs, to underpay, right? <clears throat> and it's, there's no reason to think he'll be any different. So don't listen to what he says. Look at what he's done. Which goes back to Lakoff's point: words matter. Oh yeah. And if you say things that incite people to value your words over somebody else's words, they can have all the facts. They can have all the truth. They can have everything going for them. But if his words ring more true emotionally, that's who you're going to vote. And that's the scary, for all of us who care about democracy, one man, one woman, one vote, that's the scariest thing. Because at any given time, there's a lot of people that are afraid. There's a lot of people that are, are you know, God, anything could be better than this. There's a lot of people that say, blow it up. Let's start all over again. And if you just say, if to a room full of people that blow it up, let's blow it up. If you say to a room full of people, you read the room, you say, well, these guys are uh, against them. Aren't we against them? Yes, we're against them. So if, if, you, if you can feed that, then you can get elected. I mean, that's, a, that's a, a way of running a campaign that is very hard to compete uh, unless you see through it. And you, but you have to... You have to first realize, how am I being triggered? And then say, okay, does, do I agree with that? What's he actually, he said this, but he did this. Which am I going to believe? And I say, look at the behavior, look at the history. Try to understand science-based, fact-based. Do your work. Don't just, you know, go by your Facebook friends. Well, see, and you're touching <laughs> on something. And this is what's really important because... Yeah. And I wanted to touch on this, uh, uh, that they're going to pull up on the screen. I saw a really intriguing video. Mm -hmm. um, and mind you, you're not supposed to really believe everything you see on the internet, I know. But this is a really cool video. Right. And they used, um, they used pennies to represent mm -hmm. millions of people. Mm -hmm. So it was a visual. Right. So they said one penny equals a million people. Right. And they had 324 pennies to represent right. 324 million people. Right. And they were using the pennies and then they used these stats. And I'm going to go ahead and read these right. off right now. So as of today, 103 million people do not have the right to vote. Which that is includes, a lot. Yeah, that includes non-citizens, children, ineligible felons. Right. 88 million never vote. They have a choice to, but they don't right. vote, not even in the ele general election. 73 million didn't vote in the 2016 primaries, but will probably vote the general election. The remaining 60 million of the 324 million, right? right? 60 million voted for the primaries, 30 million Democrat, 30 million Republican, and half of those primary voters chose other candidates, mm -hmm. right? Not even mm -hmm. in, within their own. Right. So then you had 40% of eligible adults, which is 9% of the nation, voted for either... Clinton or Trump. Hmm. And that means 161 million eligible voters did not vote for Clinton or Trump. And basically the, the, the premise of the video was that third party and independent votes are not a wasted vote, even though you're led to believe that, right? right. Um, I had a little trouble with the video because they kept putting Trump before Clinton and I thought Clinton is a C and mm -hmm. that right. made me mad as a feminist, right? Yeah, right? I don't know if I'm a feminist, I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> that made me upset that they did Trump versus Clinton, whatever. Right. So the thing is, is my whole thing with is how, how do you get the younger generation motivated, inspired, yeah. and want to vote? Because they're with social media. Right. Everything's so click and quick, click and quick. Right. There isn't the going to a poll, the excitement of going to a poll and voting. Like my stepdad still loves to go to the poll. That's right. like, it feels like right. his civic duty. He's a, you know, he was a vet right. um, in the army, yeah. fought in the war in Nam. So to him, that's his civic duty and he has right. pride. But the millennials of today, right. Right? It's what do we do to well, incite that? It, it, again, going back to uh, uh, Facebook. Right. One of the things that I've seen circulate, which uh, I've seen coming from uh, Trump supporters that I went to high school with, <laughs> and John Stewart. Okay. So you pretty oh, much both yeah. ends of the spectrum, and that is um, uh, mandating some okay. kind of public service for at least a year or two years 
for all high school graduates, or even not high school graduates. Maybe even, I'm, I'm saying, uh, maybe even for seniors get their high school equivalency by volunteering uh, in a hospital, uh, joining the military, right. uh, doing some kind of, because I think what's happened is, and again, there's been many studies, there's a book called Bowling Alone. It's all about the fragmentation. We need to find ways of bringing our voices into uh, touch with what it means to be a citizen, how important that is, how we value each other, the commonwealth, right. uh, and how do we build upon that. No, I agree. Um, I think a lot of it too is parents and, and those in charge and authority to be the ones to encourage right. the youth to want to. I mean, I have friends in their 20s that I just have no desire to vote. How can you live in a country of freedom and not want to have a desire to have a... Maybe they just don't believe that. They, I mean, if there's a 161 million people not voting, then they're clearly being told or they believe right. that it doesn't matter. They don't matter. Well, and I, I, maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but I think that social media and the way young people are savvy with social media right. can actually, I'd say over the next 10 years, I don't saying it will, but can actually perhaps encourage younger millennials to actually run for candidacy. And that's what I really am advocating, and that is particularly for those who are so uh, motivated by Bernie. Um, he was to, definitely for the younger crowd, too. Yeah, but to understand, if you really liked what Bernie Sanders had to say, then live Bernie Sanders' life. That's what I love about Christians. Why don't you live a life like Jesus? Oh, there you go. Then, so then, that, so we'll then sum call that yourself up. a to, Christian. To end, the, to, right. to end the story, live your life like Jesus. Or live your life like Bernie. Live your life like Run Bernie. Run for mayor. Run for city council. Run for school board. Well, Ron, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Went this has been fast. very informative and educated. <laughs> You've opened my eyes to many things. Thank you very much. This is McAngeline signing off for this episode of Soapbox. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am.